prayer is an important part of our lives. And our sermon tonight is going to be, Lord, teach us to pray. And that's taken from Luke chapter 11, verse 1. In Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, we see here that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. The prayer life is a very, very important part of who we are as God's people. On a scale from 1 to 10, the importance of prayer in the Christian's life has got to be a 100. And I realize that's hyperbole, but, but, but seriousness, uh, prayer is such an important aspect, and yet it is so often overlooked when it comes to one of the most important blessings that God has given us as Christians. Many of us enjoy talking with our loved ones, and nearly all of us have those whom we love that are no longer here, that we would give anything if we could have just one more conversation. You see, communication is such an integral and foundational part of any type of relationship. Whenever you have a lack of communication, the relationship, whether it's at work or at home, is going to start to break down. In fact, in a study that was published with a thousand couples that were studied that were going through marital problems, the number one thing that the women in the, in the relationship said that they thought was lacking and that they wanted more of was communication. Now the interesting thing, the men in, that, in those, those thousand couples, that didn't make the top five. <laughs> so maybe it's like that in your house, I don't know. Uh, but, but, but wives crave communication, and they want to talk. But it's the same thing when it comes to us and our relationship with God. We need that communication in our life. Unfortunately, many Christians are suffering because just like in the 1967 movie, Cool Hand Luke, uh, what we have here is a failure to communicate. And that line has been uh, adopted by popular culture in the United States. But so many times people struggle in their Christianity and it all gets back to, I think, not knowing how to communicate with God in an effective way. Our spiritual relationship is important for us to have prayer. We need prayer in our lives. It's a time of solace and comfort. Jesus oftentimes uh, prayed. The, the, you cannot read the Gospels straight way through without realizing just how many times it mentions the prayer life of Jesus. Then here in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, the disciples are interested in what Jesus has to teach them about prayer. They say, Lord, teach us how to pray. And it says there in Luke 11, verse 1 through 4, it says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not to temptation. And so I want us to think about the very first part of what they say here, Lord, teach us how to pray. And I want us to respond to that request that that disciple had by taking the time tonight to look comprehensively at what the Bible has to say about the prayer life of Jesus. And so we're going to be going through a lot of scriptures tonight. You can try to flip there as we go along or, or see them on the screen. But I think it's important for us to see if Christ was God in the flesh and He is our model, we're trying to conform ourselves to His image. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, I think is part of the crux of verses of what Christianity is all about, then if we're going to model our prayer life after Jesus's, what is that going to look like in our life? So tonight I want us to see those passages that talk about the Lord and how He prayed and see if that can help us in our own prayer life. The first passage I want us to look at is Matthew chapter 14, verse 23. And in this passage it emphasizes that Jesus would often go to a quiet place to pray. In that passage it says, And after He had sent the crowds away, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 6, Jesus also talks about the importance of praying quietly. He says there in that passage, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have, had their, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and you shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret will reward you. Take some time to go into a quiet place. Maybe it's a study in your house. Maybe it's in your car on the way to work. Uh, find a place that is quiet, that you can put away the cares of this world and devote some time to prayer. The Lord was extremely busy in His 1,000 days of His earthly ministry. He was only on the earth preaching and teaching for about three years. In that time, He was surrounded by crowds and His disciples, and yet He still saw the importance to take the time to take a step back in quietness and pray to the Father. I know you've got a busy life at the hustle bustle of work, of jobs, of careers, whatever it may be that just seems like this, all your time is, is just never enough. Find time. I was told one time that by someone, you make time for the things that you want to make time for. 
If you really want to do something, you'll find the time to do it. Find some time to go to a quiet place and just decompress and pray. The Lord needed that in His ministry, and you need it in your life as well. The second thing that we can learn from Christ and His prayer is that His prayers were emotional. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 talks about how emotional those prayers could be. I think in Hebrews 5, 7, it's talking about uh, right before the cross and on the cross. It says there in that passage, In the days of His flesh He offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the One who was able to save Him from death, and He was heard because of His piety. Now, Jesus, when He prayed, it wasn't stoic. It wasn't um, uh, removed of all emotions. When Jesus prayed, He opened up His heart to His Heavenly Father. And you and I have got to follow that same example. I think about on the cross when Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, Jesus is actually quoting a prayer of David that's recorded in Psalm chapter 22, verses 1-2. through and that psalm, uh, David says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. In fact, oftentimes, if you will read the Psalms, you will see that many of the prayers that David has with God, he is he's very emotional, and he's crying out, and he's, he's scared sometimes, sometimes he's angry. Now, if you read Lamentations, uh, lamenting is just a word that means crying openly, bitterly. And if you read the book of Lamentations, that's why Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Because when you read those laments, when he prays to God for his people and for the nation of, of Judah and Israel, you can see just, just how emotional Jeremiah is in those passages. And so when you see the prayers of the Old Testament, they are filled with emotion. Uh, when you go to God in prayer, He knows what you're dealing with in this life. He knows your emotions. He knows if you're scared. He knows if you're angry. He knows if you're frustrated. He knows if you're happy. Pray with those emotions. Don't try to hide those emotions from God because it makes no sense because He already knows what you're going through. And so allow yourself to be open and to be honest with yourself, but also with God in prayer, and you will find yourself having a sense of calm and peace that you would not otherwise have unless you would completely open up to God. Be open and honest and let your emotion be before your Heavenly Father. The next thing we can learn from Christ is that His prayers were long. Now, if you see here um, in Luke chapter 11, that's actually a pretty short prayer. But sometimes people have taken what Jesus says in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, and seen that short prayer and say, well, it's bad to pray long prayers. And, you know, Jesus said, you know, the Gentiles think they'll be heard from many words. That's not exactly what Jesus is talking about there. He's talking about when the, when the Romans would pray, when the pagans would pray, they would have these really long, lofty words. and didn't mean anything, but they just thought that the, the more they rambled, the more they would be heard. That's not what Jesus is talking about. In Luke chapter 6 verse 12 it says, and it was at that time that he went up on the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And so Jesus needed to take a long amounts of times to pray. I know talking to Brittany, uh, sometimes she would travel to Georgia back and forth from West Tennessee when we were married uh, by herself. And I'd say, what, what did you do? And she'd say, honestly, for a couple hours I would just pray. Um, if I'm in Atlanta, I pray too, right? It's not normally, it's not hours long, but, you know, help me not around this person real quick. Anyways, um, it's a person which I'm working on, okay? Um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes it's good for us just to take some extended time and just to pray and just open up our hearts before God and, and let Him know that we're struggling with. I and mean, we need that sometimes. The Lord needed that. And if Jesus needed to, to pray all night long sometimes because of the anxiety and frustration that He had with His earthly ministry or, or through the things He was going with, then how much more is it appropriate for us to pray? Uh, be sure that when you pray that it's meaningful. And the more meaningful your prayers are sometimes, the longer they'll be. Sometimes the more meaningful your prayers are, the shorter they'll be. It's just like Luke 11, 2 through 4. And so there's nothing wrong with long prayers and there's nothing wrong with short prayers. It depends on how you're feeling, the situation that you're in, the amount of time that you have. And so sometimes the Lord's prayers were very short. And so we've got to be sure that we're taking the appropriate amount of time, whatever it may be, in whatever situation that we're in, to pray to God. Because we can see from the Bible that both Jesus used both long prayers and short prayers in His prayer life. The next thing we can see is that Christ prayed alone. Luke 9, chapter 18 says, And it happened that while He was praying alone. 
It's important for us to be able to take some time by ourselves and pray. It's important to prayer communally. And that's one of the things that Kyle talked about on Wednesday, the importance of praying as God's people, which I think was uh, completely spot on. And it's important for us to get together as a church family and to pray together. It's important to pray with our families. But we've got to be sure that we're also taking the time to step aside and pray alone by ourselves sometimes. If you pray with your kids and your wife before every meal, that's fantastic. If you pray together before you go to bed, that's wonderful. But still be sure you're taking the time yourself to pray personal prayers on your own time. To be sure that you're opening up your heart as an individual, not collectively, but as a person to God about the things that you need in your life that maybe you don't even feel uh, comfortable expressing out loud before others. Be sure that you're taking the time to personally pray with God. Uh, Jesus prayed with His disciples, but He also took the time to seclude himself from time to time to be sure that he prayed by himself with just him and God. The next thing that we can learn from God, from Jesus and his prayer life to God, is that it was regular. Luke chapter 5 verse 16 says, But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. And so it was very common for Jesus to go and pray. In fact, one of the things that is quite interesting, if you ever think about it, how did Judas know where to take the Roman guards to rest Jesus? on the Mount of Olives. It seemed like it was a place where he would often go to pray. And so it seemed like Judas knew that that is where he was going to be. So Jesus prayed regularly. It's important for us to also pray regularly. Uh, don't let prayer be something that you just do whenever you need something. Right? Don't let prayer be something that you just do occasionally. Or whenever you come to church, they bow our heads. We have, we've got to bow our heads and pray. Don't let that be the only time you pray. Pray regularly. Pray often. Pray throughout the day. Uh, pray before your meals. Pray before you go to bed. Pray. Set up certain times whenever you go to work to say a prayer. Uh, set up a time to pray for those who are sick and suffering. Pray all the time. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 to pray without ceasing. The more you pray, the stronger spiritually you're going to be. The less you pray, the weaker spiritually you're going to be. Now, if that's the case, isn't it important for us to be praying without ceasing like the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17? All the time. So many times when I talk to people who are struggling spiritually, I'll ask them, are you praying? How's your prayer life? And they'll say, it's not like it's supposed to be. When we don't pray, our minds are not focused on heavenly things. Colossians chapter 4 tells us to focus our minds on heavenly things, things that are above. When we pray, we are readjusting our sights towards heavenly things, away from earthly things. And when we go days, weeks without praying, we're never readjusting that sight. And so it's very easy and understandable to realize that we're in the pit of sin because we've never taken the time to stop and regaze our sights back towards heaven. And we do that through our prayer life. We've got to be sure that we take that time to pray regularly. If we're struggling, if you are struggling spiritually, be sure to pray and pray often. Praying daily is not enough. Uh, praying once a day is not enough. Pray often. Pray without ceasing. The next thing we can see from Jesus and His relationship with God through prayer is that it had repetition. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 44, that passage that we're all familiar with is the time where Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and He prays three times for this cup to pass from Him. This cup of anguish and pain and loss. He prays for the Father. Jesus knows what is about to take place before Him. He knows what the plan has been since the foundations of the universe. And yet He still prays three times for God to take that cup and for it to pass. And you may ask, why is He doing that? Well, I think it's actually connected to something that happens earlier in Jesus' ministry in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And in that passage, there is a story, a parable that Jesus tells about the unjust judge and the persistent widow. And there's a widow who has been wronged. And she goes before the judge, and the judge dismisses her case because he is unjust. And the widow persists day after day after day and just, just wears him out. And eventually he gives her what she is due because he just can't take her nagging anymore. And Jesus says, if an unjust judge is like this, what do you think your heavenly father is going to do? And in verses 7 and 8 of that passage, he says, And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. And verse 1 tells us why Jesus told this parable. And that is so that they would have heart and always pray. And so, is it important for us to pray 
more than one time for something? Absolutely. If you want something, if you need something in your life, and you pray one time, it doesn't happen, keep praying. Now, don't mishear me. That's not a guarantee that just because you pray all the time, you're going to get that thing. But Jesus does tell us that, that we need to pray often for things. If you think it's important in your life, you think that you need that, if you need strength and comfort and peace, or, or you're going through a hard situation, don't pray about it one time. Pray about it continually. Let God know that's something that you're struggling with, not just one day, but for several days, several months, years. Let Him know that burden is on you. Uh, Paul prayed three times for the Lord to take away his physical affliction. Now, he answered Paul and said, Paul, I'm not going to take it away. And that might be your answer too. I'm not taking it away, but just because Paul had enough sense to know, I'm going to pray until I get an answer. We've got to be the exact same way and pray with repetition. And Jesus received His answer in the garden, and that answer was no. And sometimes that's going to be the case. But we still need to pray with repetition when we think that we need something the Lord can help us with. The next thing that we can see that Jesus had in His prayer life was thankfulness. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 19, it says, In ordering the people to sit on the grass, He took five loaves and two fishes, and looking up towards heaven, He blessed the food, and breaking the loaves, He gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And so not only is it important to pray uh, before meals to reinforce the fact to our children that God is the one who blesses us with His food and that it is a great reminder of the abundance that we have, but also for us adults, we need to be reminded of the fact that all good and perfect gifts come from our Father who is in heaven. That that food is on that table not because of our um, work ethic and because of our good jobs and because we've made our way, but because God has richly blessed us. I mean, think about this for a second. For 99% of human existence, up until like the last 50 years, the number one worry for mankind, for all of human history, has been starvation. Acquiring enough food to survive without refrigeration, without stores and marketplaces and overabundance of food, man's main concern has been starvation. We live in a day and age where the fitness industry is an $80 billion a year industry. Because we have so much food, we definitely ain't worried about starving, right? I mean, think of how blessed we are, how things have changed so rapidly in the last 40 or 50 years. And so God has, we, we have been so blessed when it comes to our food. And so it's important for us to take a step back and thank God, not only for our food, but for all the many wonderful blessings that He's given us with. Um, uh, pray before your meals. I think it's a wonderful habit to have. Uh, pray in, in private. Also pray in public. Um, if you're too afraid to pray in public in a public place with other people around you, you've probably got bigger spiritual issues than praying for thankfulness. And you're probably too concerned about the world and what the world thinks of you. And as Christians, we should be concerned about changing the world and not what the world thinks of us as Christians. And so uh, if you're too afraid to pray in a public place, you got some bigger problems you got to fry besides thankfulness. Uh, when, if you're a Christian... You wake up in the morning and you step your foot out of bed, you've just offended the world because you live for Christ. So don't worry about praying in public at a, at a restaurant. That's my mini soapbox. Moving on. Okay, sorry. All right. Uh, Christ prayed for others. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 13, it says, Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked him, rebuked them. Be sure that when you approach God in prayer, that you're making sure that a portion of your prayer or at, you have a specific prayer scheduled at some point in the day to pray for others. That's important to pray for yourself. It's important to pray for your struggles. It's important to pray for the things that you want, that God can help you with. But it is an extremely important duty that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ to take time and pray for each other. And so I, I would surmise to you that to... Take some time out of your prayer or make a specific time in your day where you're going to pray for other people, especially for those who are sick and shut in in this congregation. Uh, take the bulletin to home and see their names and pray over them at least one time. Uh, and when you see them, let them know you're praying for them. Uh, because when you tell them, that, hey, I I'm praying for you, we pray for you every day, their, their eyes just light up. It just changes their entire mood to know that somebody is praying for them on a regular basis. And as a church family, that's what we're called to do. Uh, we're supposed to be looking out for each other and praying for each other. So be sure that you're praying for this congregation sick and shut-ins every day or at least on some sort of regular basis. And when you see them, uh, let them know that you're praying for them. 
Christ also prayed for His church. In John chapter 17, verses 20 through 21, we won't look at that whole passage for time's sake, but if you've got some time, if you want to see how Jesus prayed, look at John chapter 17. That's one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night that He's betrayed, hours before He is scourged and crucified. And you see what's on His heart and on His mind the last few hours of His life. It's a beautiful prayer. But in John 17, 20 through 21, as He's closing that prayer, He prays for you and He prays for me. He prays, I do not ask for these only, but for those who will believe in me through their word. And so Christ, as he is nearing the cross, he prays for the apostles and the disciples in the earlier verses. But here in verse 20 and 21, he prays for you and I. He prays, so pray for his church. When you pray, pray for the Lord's church. Pray for this congregation. Uh, pray for the elders. Pray for the deacons. Pray for uh, the ministers. Uh, pray for each and every individual member. Uh, pray for the work that is going on. Pray for our programs. Uh, pray for everyone for this congregation. Uh, pray for the children as they try to grow up and navigate a life of and uh, spending their time at school in the world with so many different distractions and so many temptations. Uh, pray for those in this congregation. Pray for our efforts to evangelize the community. And pray for the church as a whole. Uh, pray for other congregations in the area. Pray for the church throughout the world. Pray for our missionaries in hard and difficult places. Uh, when you take time, pray for the Lord's church. Uh, Christ died for the church to purchase it with His blood, Acts 20, 28. If it was that important to Christ, and we're His followers, the church ought to be important to us. And so be sure when you pray that you're praying for the Lord's church and for its effectiveness and its growth. Now he also prayed in verse 21 that they may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world might believe that you have sent me. Also pray for the church's unity and love. Now so many times today we see churches that are pulled apart, not for doctrinal issues, but just out of some people not conforming to the image of Christ. Uh, we need to be individuals who are praying for the church, but also praying that the church will be unified in love, but also in the doctrine of Christ. Christ also prayed for the forgiveness of others. In Luke chapter 23, verse 34, as He's hanging on the cross, it says, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And this can be one of the hardest things that we can pray for. It's for the forgiveness of other individuals that have wronged us. And I think it's interesting here that on the cross, Jesus gives us this ultimate example of what it means to have a forgiving heart. And that as Christians, we also are to forgive because the Lord not only gives us an example, He also gives us a warning. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15, Jesus says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you of your trespasses. So we've got to be sure that we also have a time to set aside to forgive those that may have wronged us. And there are many biblical examples of individuals who prayed to God. And prayer is such a wonderful thing for us to see from individuals like Hannah or Ezra or Jeremiah or Daniel or Peter or Paul or Stephen or other individuals in both the Old and New Testament. And they are certainly worth looking at. But tonight I wanted us to look at what the Savior had to teach us about prayer life. And the 11 things or 12 things that He teaches us is that we've got to be able to pray quietly. And I'll back up so you can see that. Uh, when you pray, pray quietly. Go to a quiet place, put away the cares of this life, and open up your heart towards God. Pray with emotion. Uh, God knows what you're going through. You don't have to hide those things from Him. Sometimes you're going to need to pray long prayers. Uh, sometimes you're going to need to pray short prayers. Uh, pray alone. Uh, pray with regularity. Uh, be sure that you're praying each and every day and, and more than just every day. Uh, pray with repetition. If there's something that's going on in your life, uh, continue to offer that before God and ask for His help in that situation. Pray with thankfulness. Always remember, even in the darkest of times, even when you're lamenting, Oftentimes, if you look at the Old Testament, especially the Psalms, this is a wonderful thing to see if you've got some time to look at that. Look at the Psalms, especially the lamenting Psalms, and you'll see how every time when David or Jeremiah starts off with asking God, why are the evil in this world, why are they flourishing? Why are they becoming stronger? Why, are you, why have you neglected your people? Why have you forsaken us? Why, why have you turned your back on us? Every single time you get to the end of that prayer, and it changes. And it goes from asking God why to thanking God for all the blessings in, your, in their life or in their situation. 
We've got to be sure when we pray that there's a sense of thankfulness. Even no matter how dark the day is, no matter what we're praying for, always be sure you thank God for the wonderful blessings He's given us. Pray for others. Pray for His church. Pray for the forgiveness of other individuals. How are you doing spiritually? Because you can probably answer that question with, how is your prayer life? If you've got a strong prayer life, you probably are standing on pretty solid ground because the communication that you have in your relationship with your Heavenly Father is solid. But when that communication is not there, that relationship is not on solid ground. And so if you're here this, tonight and you have an issue in your spiritual walk, you feel like that you don't have that solid footing, maybe it's because your prayer life isn't what it needs to be. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, there's only one mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Christ Jesus, He's the one who died, and He is the one who intercedes for us. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. And Hebrews 7, 25 says, Therefore He is able also to save forever those who draw near to Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. And Romans chapter 6, verse 11 says that if we're going to be alive to God, we've got to be in Christ Jesus. And the only two verses that tell us how to get into Christ is Romans 6, 3 and Galatians 3, 27. We're baptized into Christ. And if you haven't done that, then you don't have an intercessor on your behalf bringing your cares and your concerns before the Father. But you can if you draw near to God through Christ, confessing Him as Lord and being baptized for remission of your sins. And if you're here tonight, like most of us are, that are Christians... How is your spiritual life? If it's not where it needs to be, be sure you're looking at your prayer life and asking, can I improve my relationship with God through improving my prayer life to God? And if the congregation can help you in any way, come down as we stand and as we sing.